thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and try to share uh, my experience as researcher. Uh, in the following minutes, I will try to summarize uh, what has been my research in the last years in, with regards to the public personal health record in Catalonia. Uh, I will basically focus on the evolution um, as from 2008 until 2016 nowadays. Um, and basically, in the end, I will present uh, the current challenges. Well, the current or the, the challenges which are still not addressed or solved, uh, which I think are relevant, uh, particularly for practitioners. Having said that, let's just provide a little bit of the context. Uh, Catalonia is an autonomous region of Spain, one of the 17 autonomous regions. Spain is uh, healthcare is completely devolved into the autonomous regions. So all the role in terms of what kind of systems they invest and the, most of the policies are defined at the regional level. And in the case of Catalonia, we're talking about a region of a population of about seven million and a half people. Um, basically, uh, we have an insurer uh, who is procuring or buying the, the services, which is the Catalan Health Service. And then we have a broad variety of providers it's a multi-provider healthcare model uh, with more than uh, 160 providers. Uh, and more or less, in, 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 in terms of what is public, what is non-public, uh, uh, if we think of primary care and long-term care, uh, both are dominated by public uh, providers, particularly primary care, where there is the what is called the Catalan Institute of Health, which accounts for nearly 87% of all the primary care centers. We're talking about, nowadays, 400 uh, primary care centers in Catalonia. And then if we think of the other two levels, which are specialized and hospital care uh, and mental care, it's mainly uh, managed by pri private uh, companies. Um, in terms of uh, IT, well, there has been traditionally a lot of autonomy uh, for the health providers to decide what kind of systems they have, how to manage them, and, and, and for the governance in general. So the result of that was that in 2008, more or less, there were more than 60 different health IT systems in general, EPRs and different systems. Uh, if we think of primary care, there were basically uh, four dominant ones, but ECAP, which is the first one, was installed and running in 87% of the primary centers because it was the solution of the dominant player there. And if we think of hospital care, there was more diversity, there were, but the dominant were uh, SAP-based uh, uh, implementations. And particularly, there's an important player here, which is the solution from IBM, which is called Argos, which is becoming dominant. Um, in this scenario, uh, and given the the different uh, strategic plans at the regional level, which basically they would like to prioritize a continuity of care, integrated care, what you can imagine is that it was impossible to be solved. Why? Because there was no standardization and no general interoperability framework. So basically all the interoperability take place between on a diet level, and there were multiple um, agreements reached at the diet level. So it was really very complex. So as a solution, the, uh, the, the, the regional government promoted a shared electronic health record called H, uh, H33. Uh, this was promoted in uh, 2008. Um, this could be seen as an interoperability framework. The idea was not to replace existing solutions, but simply to provide them a way to interoperate. Um, and also, um, the, um, who connected to this interoperability framework? Hospitals, social care, mental care, um, uh, primary care centers, emergency primary care centers, and more recently, uh, rehabilitation, dialysis centers, and social services. So uh, all the uh, uh, health and social uh, care is nowadays currently connected. Um, how does this work? Well, basically, as I said, this interoperability framework in which the health providers can, well, can publish, it, can use it, can use it as a repository of information or can use it simply as an index. So there's a central index and health providers have to publish information. Uh, the big ones only publish that information in the index, but they keep the information, but many of the small ones are using that as a repository. Why? Because it can guarantee the 24 hours, seven days of access. That's the reason the, 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 
the regional government decided to create also central repository to provide access for the smaller providers who could not guarantee that services. Um, what kind of information can health uh, professionals access? Basically, information came from two sources. The same providers, here we have primary care, like diagnosis, healthcare reports, immunizations, chronic patient levels, specialized care, and diagnosis procedures, but also from the Department of Health, like medical uh, activity database, uh, prescriptions and dispensations, and also advanced directives. Uh, nowadays, who is connected? Well, all the primary care centers are connected and all the hospitals are connected. Not only connected, but everybody is publishing. Uh, if we think of the social, social care, 99% of centers are only connected, and if we think the mental care, 95 uh, uh, centers are connected and publishing. The fact that everybody is publishing doesn't mean, of course, that the quality of information is perfect, but at least everybody is publishing. And of course, when I mean, when I mean that the quality of information is not the one desired, is myself as a citizen, when I access the primary health uh, record, I realize that some, in some cases, not all the information is being published that it should be, but that's, that's normal. Well, I will not focus much on statistics because I have never done or analyze the use of, the, of these solutions. Uh, this has not been a simple repository. There has been uh, two main stages in this evolution. Uh, from 2008 to 2009, it was ma mainly used as a repository through index or direct repository of health data. It was a document-oriented database, okay? So the idea was that data was not structured there. It was basically links to PDF documents, as many of, well, some of the previous presenters has emphasized also in their solutions. The access was done through web browser for professionals only, and there was, I would say, a static view of the patient. And since 2012, uh, sorry, there has been a transformation, there has been a completely new platform in terms of technology, but also in terms of services. The idea is to transform that into not into a repository of health data, not only for primary care, but primary hospital, social and sanitary and mental care, so everybody's connected. And the idea is that the data now is more structured, for instance, if diagnosis, immunization, spirometry, et cetera, et cetera, allowing things like more, more analytics, okay, and new projects like open data project, which is running nowadays. Then the access is now not only through browser, but many of the health providers, the big ones particularly, have integrated that with their clinical workstations. And there is an extension of this um, HC3 from a messaging platform to include all the uh, patient trajectory and the management of the clinical protocols. And this is a big project running still nowadays. Uh, what happened in 2010 is that once they had this in place, they decided to open it to the citizen. And this is where the patient health record, public patient health record was born. So basically, initially, what we have is that they simply open this HC3 through a web browser to the citizens, uh, and uh, it acted as a viewer of patient uh, personal data and clinical data like diagnosis, vaccines, reports, such ambulatory cures, hospital emergency, and hospital admission. This was initially. Other decisions made then was the authentication and the registration. Well, basically, authentication took place through the ID of the healthcare plus uh, digital certificates, which were issued at the Chamber of Commerce and municipalities, but it was uh, the health department was not in charge of that. The access was done basically through a web browser, and it was piloted in 2011 uh, in several villages in the north of Barcelona, involving three health providers and uh, five villages, and um, there were 90,000 uh, 90, citizens. Uh, the results in terms of usage were a disaster, as you can imagine. Uh, but anyway, the project go on. And it went on into a new stage. This first stage, the label is important, Carpeta Personal de Salud stands for Personal Health Folder. Okay, so a folder where you find your information, simply that. Then it moved to a new stage, which was labeled Canal Personal de Salud, which means Personal Health Channel. Okay, of course, these labels uh, quite often are tied to new managers that enter and want to emphasize a new label, but the idea was to emphasize more, not only the container of data, but also the communication with 
um, the, between the citizens and the, and the professionals. In this, uh, in this new stage, basically two years, new services were incorporated, as it was seen before in the case of Norway. Also in our case, the medication plan was incorporated. So services which already existed there were connected um, and, and were shown, and new kind of reports like laboratory tests, imaging reports, and anticipatory wills. There was in this uh, stage uh, a gradual extension or rollout to all Catalonia in three phases. So by the end of 2000, well, by 2013, initially everybody in Catalonia could access that. And the main change here was this idea of interoperability framework. What is this? The idea here is that the health department uh, realized, well, they already were aware of that, that with content there was no value or there was, the, the citizen would not perceive any utility or much utility. So they consider that there's a need to launch services there. Um, uh, first, uh, we are in the middle of a crisis at that moment. Uh, so there was no money to develop new services. And second, there were some existing services running from the health providers. So the idea is to transform this um, portal more into a platform in the sense that uh, third party providers would provide their uh, services through the portal and the idea is that citizens will use this personal health record to access to some of the existing services which until then had been scattered. So users were using them in some cases but directly through the provider, never through the um, health uh, system. So this was the second uh, phase, I will skip it quickly, and we move to the third phase, which has been more the explosion in terms of usage, but particularly in terms of the philosophy of the portal. And uh, now again, uh, there was a new management team, so now it's been uh, relabeled, and now it's called My Health, La Meva Salut, My Health, well, My Health. Okay, and uh, the basic changes are, first, there's completely new authentication, um, uh, mechanism or service. Now there's no need for digital certificate anymore and there's simply a robust password. So as you access to the bank, even though we don't use our bank password, we have, but now where do you pick that password? You pick in primary care centers. So most of the citizens or the citizens that go to the primary care at least can access that. Okay, and basically, so the access is simple. The result from this new change in terms of, if you look at the graph, it's impressive. If you look at the numbers, it's not impressive in the sense that we're talking about 81,000 uh, citizens having access to that, which is a lot compared to before, but it's not significant, thinking about seven and a half million. But the uh, monthly uh, accesses are increasing. Okay, so this is some positive results. But these results are not only because of this simple, simpler authentication service, are also because of two new things, or several new things. First, there has been a mobility master plan for health. Uh, in Barcelona, we host what is called the mobile health capital. Okay, and um, uh, there has been some synergies and the health department has created a chapter in the mobile health, which is promoting mobile health apps. Uh, so here, the idea is that the, the Department of Health through some agencies are playing a role of, a credit, uh, of developing some accreditation processes for uh, companies that develop apps, and similar to the idea of Trento, the idea is that here now, uh, or, or similar as far as I've understood, the professional uh, will uh, um, from now on prescribe not only medicines, but also will prescribe in some cases apps. Okay, there's an, uh, an, an accreditation protocol and, and, and many aspects to be seen. Uh, but that's simply uh, acting as a marketplace, so no big innovation. Okay, the innovation is the idea of the digital health portal, which is, in, why, why is innovation? Because until now, what I've seen in the previous slides, there's no input or there's no collection of information from the patient side to the system. The idea is now through the wearables, apps, medical devices, the idea is that the citizen at some point has to start collecting information and that information be entered into the health system to be used. So there's a need to develop a new interface, a new platform, and this is called the digital health platform, in which the citizen is supposed to have their own repository of data where they can, where he can manage, he or she can manage that data. So uploading information, giving access permission to third parties to access that information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, this will have to be integrated or interconnected with this HC, HC 
three. So this is really a big uh, transition. This is under design mode, so there's no pilot yet, okay? And another service which has made the difference in this last stage is similar to what Media Grisot explained before. We have the our a consultation service. This was a service launched in July 2015. It has been uh, tested until October 2015. And the results, it was tested in Barcelona with three health providers, different health providers, okay? It's a service for communication between patient and, um, and general practitioner, okay? But the idea is that it is integrated in the uh, practitioner uh, clinical work sta uh, 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 station. Um, uh, there are some commitments, for instance, uh, uh, 28-hour uh, response maximum, um, and the results has been that it has been used by 201 uh, professionals, uh, by 1,000 uh, patients, there has been 2,300 conversations and about 2,000 uh, messages. But the important thing is not these numbers, the important thing is that uh, nowadays ge these general practitioners are measured based on this, so this type of interactions known as the physical ones. So this is really the, one of the initial transformations that could happen there. Okay, just to finish, Josh, what do we have nowadays in this uh, primary health record? So this information, I will skip it because we don't have time, sorry. Uh, let me just, because I think it's important to present some of the challenges which I think are recurrent in the audience. First, I would like to start saying that this project was not born from the patient side, it was born from the provider side. Okay, and this is a big problem. Why? Because it has been organizational dependent on the HC3. And the money, the budget, the organization, everything depended on the HC3. Which means that the time, the priorities were completely different from the patient perspective. Since this year, well, since three, three months ago that there was a new government, this has been separated and now there's a separate governance and management of that. I don't know if it will make a difference, but at least it's a different governance structure that it's supposed to be promising. Second, the initial vision and goal was to encourage self-care and preventive care. Has this occurred? Obviously not, where as far as I'm concerned, or as I know, okay? Why? Because to accomplish this, there's a need to reconfigure the relationships between patients, professionals, between patients, government, between professionals, government, between professionals, professionals. Okay, uh, there's potential with new services because there's a new non-face-to-face -face care model being um, developed and implemented on PowerPoint only, but at least it's, there are some new services launched. This type of a consultation, this is a big challenge, and, 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 but it, and, and well, they are struggling on that. Another important thing is how to achieve the, res the citizen's responsibility about their own health. Um, here, we've seen it with the Swedish example. Uh, we are also at the regional level thinking about how do we give mechanisms and instruments for the citizens to really uh, execute or be a, not only be aware that they are owner, but that they can give access to third parties. So the, what we call the e-consent model. And finally, also very important is, what is the role of the public administration here? Um, how to, uh, the role every time is more uh, about facilitator, a platform, but how to allow really third parties to innovate in these new services? And here we have this interoperability framework and digital health platform, which are, let's say, pieces there, but really there's no, um, they have not already bootstrapped basically for fear on the political level, no? But this is uh, an important thing that has to be solved. 